Hey guys, welcome back to Mastering You with Matt Sutton. And boy, do we have a mastery episode for you today. Today, I'm talking to Stephen Rudolph. In 1989, while pursuing a career in music in New York, Stephen took up a part-time teaching job to make ends meet. In his first class, he had an epiphany. He had an innate capacity to teach. And this realization led him on a 21-year quest to India, where he uncovered 5,000-year-old secrets to self-understanding and achieving one's potential. You can guess why he's on Mastering You, right? Uh, so Stephen has taken those principles and crafted them into an easy-to-use, enjoyable program called Feed Your Tigers. And today, Stephen hosts the Feed Your Tigers podcast that helps people identify and align their natural talents so they can thrive. I told you it's going to be a good one. Hey, Stephen, how are we doing today? Hey, I'm doing fine. So nice to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm super excited for this. Uh, my first question, or two questions, really. What took you on that trip to India? And how did you come across Sanskrit texts? Texts, sorry. Right. So, you know, I think the the universe has brought me situations uh, in my life. And sometimes there have been ones where I've had to make a conscious decision about something where it's like, hmm, you know, should I do this or shouldn't I do? And I've gone back and forth. And other times this door opens up and it's like, okay, this is the door that I go through. And as you were just uh, introducing me in that, that story, I had this incredible experience that I have an innate capacity, a capacity to teach. It's just something I knew the minute that I started doing it that I never realized. I was 22 at the time that I taught my first class when I had that uh, realization. And so the door that opened up was when I started to teach, I was like, oh my God, I have to, I have to do this. And I want to open up a school and I want my school to be a place where every child knows who they are. Like that should be the curriculum. The curriculum should not be about passing all these exams and then just only going to college. The central of the curriculum should, should center of the curriculum should, should be that. And it was almost like, as I conceived of that, a friend of mine contacted me. He's like, hey, you should come to India and open up this school here. And I was like, whoa, how would that wow. be? So the door just opened and, and I went. I, I didn't really think about it. I didn't have to make a conscious choice. And so then that it wound up being 21 years. Not like I sort of like planned, <laughs> planned ahead of time that it would be 21 years. I would what were you teaching, Stephen? So I was teaching English at the time. When I got this job, I, I wanted to be a rock star. So I was in New York City trying to like, you know, make make ends meet. And I got a part time job as a teacher just teaching English. And you um, had no and, formal qualifications in teaching? Nothing. I, I spoke English. Like for me, that was like, I thought, okay, I know English. How, how hard could it be? But um, I what I found it, out. How do you get a job as a teacher if you don't have any formal qualifications in teaching? Is this um, well, the this, way of the world back I mean, then? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid. This was ESL. So, you know, we're not talking like literature. These are people who've come to the U.S. And at that time, in the early 90s, there was a big influx of, uh, there were a lot of immigrants coming into the States at that time. Um, I remember, because I was in New York, at that point, you know, when um, the Soviet Union was, was disbanded, a lot of Russians came to New York at that time. So many of my students were, were about a million Russians came into New York and into the States at that time. So there was a huge need for um, not just teaching language, but um, teaching about culture and how the, how the world, the world worked in, in America. So that's, that's what it was that I did. But the thing that was fascinating for me was when I, when, you know, I'll never forget the first day that I had to teach, right? Like this woman calls me and she's like, okay, you got the job. And I was surprised. And she, I'm like, when do I start? She's like, how about in one hour? Because the teacher who they had, like they had one teacher who had to like suddenly quit. So I'm like, okay. And so I like run there as fast as I can. You know, I took a train and I run up the stairs and I get there five minutes before my class is supposed to start. And then I said to her, listen, I have to confess something. I don't know how to teach. <laughs> like I've never done it before. And she, and I'll never forget my whole teacher training consisted of her putting the book in my hand and she puts her back, her hand on my back and she goes, and she, she comes up to my ear and she says into my ear, just remember, you know more than they do. And she, she pushes me into the classroom. <laughs> that was my entire teacher training. And so I get into the class. And when I start, started to teach, I, uh, it, was, it was eerily familiar to me. Like I was a fish in water. 
So that was the thing that really triggered me. I was like, why do I know this? Why does this feel so natural to me? And I'd never discovered that before because I really never had that an opportunity to teach. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that I was not alone in an experience like that where different people have different aptitudes or different propensities or tendencies, which I call tigers. Like for some people, it's about administration. They are natural organizers and people who get things done. Like that comes naturally for them. They don't have to think about it. Um, you know, they don't need to go to a course or to be taught programs and how to organize and, and delegate. They do it instinctively or entrepreneurial, an entrepreneurial tiger. There are some people like if you find the quote unquote successful entrepreneurs there, they will tell you that you can't learn this in a book. Like you're born with it. They'll tell you that like, that's, that's what it's about. So that's what really struck me. This principle that there are these qualities I've identified like 19 of these tigers. There are nine very important ones. And then okay. there's additional ones. Um, wh why do you call them the, the tigers? Mm -hmm. So we have these tendencies inside of us where we want to do something like when you wake up, like you've got to do something, you know, you have to do something. You, you got to put your energy somewhere you go and you eat, you know, you eat, maybe you shower, you eat breakfast and then it's like, I got to do something. So one of the features or qualities of human beings is that you have to act. And we're in a society, we're in a world where people are interacting and we're compelled to bring some value to society in order to survive, in order to to contribute something to the, the those who are out there so I get something in return and I you know can support and sustain myself. So these tigers, these these tendencies to act, they they need to be engaged. In other words, like somebody who is there's what I call an entertaining tiger. This is a tendency to amuse other people. And you would have seen this with some people you're around as a crowd, they just start to, they make jokes, they can tell stories, they it just comes to them. So it's like mm a social purpose that they provide is to provide entertainment and animation and enthusiasm and motivation to to others there are some people as i said like who who bring an entrepreneurial tiger there are some people who are more healing so they can they empathize with others and they feel others pain or imbalance and that's what they're bringing to the table and they can't stop themselves from doing that and like a tiger they need to eat they need to eat healing people they yeah. need to eat creativity there's some people who need to create like in my case i have this enormous educative tiger so i have this thing that wants to teach whether i like it or not it does its thing even if i'm not paying attention i will um you know just unwittingly start to explain things to people and and it eats uh, yeah so that's why i call yeah, it i tigers. like it it's, it's similar to how people i guess talk about their their core values, the things that they value, but it almost sounds like it's something almost a, a bit more actionable exactly. than just having a set of core values. And that was one of the things that I took away from India, because when I read the literature there, it, they didn't talk about it in terms of tigers. That was something that I, I added to. But what they did say, like if you go into some of the essential texts like the Bhagavad Gita, um, where, where um, Krishna is uh, talking to Arjuna. So, you know, Krishna is the charioteer. He's sort of like the Zeus of the pantheon of gods there. And, and Arjuna is like this warrior. He's, he's the, the top warrior and he's got to face this one fight, this battle. And he doesn't want to fight in this fight because many of his relatives are on the other side and he doesn't want to kill them. So he's like having all these doubts and should I be doing this? So, um, Krishna basically sits him down and says to him, hey, look, um, everybody has a nature. It's called prakriti or svabhav. Everybody's got a nature. Like you've got this thing that drives you to act. Every person has to act. You can't not act. And therefore, if you have to act, it's better that you act in accordance with your nature. And in this case, he's saying to him, like your nature is a warrior. Therefore, your the good that you can do is that you can engage yourself as a warrior because that's what you were meant to do. And he's saying to him, no, no, I'm going to run away. Like I'll become a, uh, you know, a monk. I'll go up into an ashram someplace and and just like. And he's like, no, you can't do that because that's a different nature. And if you've got this warrior's nature, wherever you go, you know, you can't run away from yourself. You're going to be like picking a fight. You're going to be looking to do that even in, in the mountains with you know I don't know some other yeah. yogis. Maybe someone snatches your chapati or something like that, and you're going to like pick a fight with them. So, it's how, um, how we in the modern day talk about living our, our or living out our authentic self, right? 
Yeah, well, that's part of it. So the these the things that drive us uniquely, these and you know what what will drive you, what will drive me, what will drive your you know a partner or your colleagues, et cetera, they're all a little bit different. But what I did notice is that there were some patterns, and that's why I derived um, a key set of nine tigers and then some supplemental ones that that are also there. And that comes directly out of that literature. So I derived it out of that. Um, and those are some of the ones I've mentioned, like a protective nature. This is a tendency yeah. to prevent harm, loss. There's some people who they can't stop themselves. Like if somebody does something wrong, says something wrong, makes a mistake, um, you know, slights somebody, they'll step in and say, you can't do that. Or, you know, this is mm. wrong, or you've got to follow the rules or you need to. And then what follows from there, of course, are careers. So there are some people who are more inclined, like, Someone who's got that protective nature would do really well as a lawyer or somebody in enforcement or somebody in quality control or in cybersecurity. So like that, your nature's inclined you toward different types of work. Nice. Just to, just rewinding then. So did you say you were only 22 when you first had that teaching experience? Right. And then, and then you went to India and, and you opened a school? Right. So, so that's what, that was my original intention was to open up this school where everybody knew who they were. So that was like the first thing that I did. So that was and like while, your first big entrepreneurial kind of venture. Venture, yeah. yeah. That that was it. I would call it a social enterprise because yeah. at the time that I did it, it was a nonprofit. But yeah. you know, we, when we talk about social entrepreneurship, it means that it is a business, but we're trying to create social value rather than just um, you know financial profit. So mm. uh, it was definitely a, a And how did it go? What 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 happened? So when I first got there like um we didn't have much money like to start off and then we couldn't afford a, a piece of land or a building so we started the school in our house myself and my and of my partners and it was like eight kids on the first day and nobody wanted to send their kids to like a school in a house so <laughs> it was re really tough and um you know, basically the kids we were able to get were, you know, one kid who failed out of like three schools and another kid who was like left back a couple of times. And I was like, bring them to me. You know, everybody's got a quality. We're going to find it. And slowly it just started to grow and people started hearing about it. So many of the parents whose kids did not fit into like the the normal kind of school environment, they said, that there's a school there that's that's interesting and it's different. So it's for different kids. And so we started to get all types of, of, and that was amazing for me because I could, I was curious that what makes them different, like why didn't they fit into that system? And so that school now has got about 2000 kids in it from nursery through 12th. So we started off on the first day of school in like 1994, there were, um, there were eight kids. And so now it's, it's wow. just grown. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. But I turned it over to, I turned it over to them. Like they didn't need me anymore. So I was like, okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah. Well, it's your legacy though, right? Yep. It's still there and it's still running. And I, I still get calls from kids uh, and, and from faculty letting me know how they're, how they're doing. So that's always encouraging. Uh, so, so you've, you've gone from playing, uh, being maybe a rock star in New York to starting a school in India. Um, you, I, that, I didn't that... necessarily achieve rock star status, but uh, <laughs> I, in my, I was a legend in my own mind. That epiphany, epiphany, sorry, can't say that word, um, mm. must have been pretty darn huge just to make that transition. It must have. Oh, yeah. Mm. That was like a, that was a bolt of lightning. I one of those things never, that you remember like yesterday? I can never forget it. I see myself in that classroom in New York City on 23rd Street and uh, 7th Avenue. And in that classroom, when it just hit me like a ton of bricks where it was like, you know, this, this, like some sort of like vacuum, that calling thing. And, and well, I mean, I don't know if I'm like over dramatizing it, but when I say like, I heard the voice from the sky, like, you're not a rock star, you're a teacher, you know, it, it, it might not have been there like vocally, but it, it was the realization that, oh my God, this is what you were meant to do. And, I'm, and I remember at the end of that class, I said to myself, oh my God, I could do this for the rest of my life. And so I'm 55 and guess what? I'm still an educator. Like it's, it, things have evolved and things, certain mm -hmm. things have changed, but, and it's, it doesn't get old. Like every time that I'm in a situation where I'm educating and I'm doing something along these lines of helping people find out and discover things about themselves, I'm still, it's still just like the first time. 
still like that that love is there that's oh, I'm, I'm going to give you the opportunity to educate me for a second Stephen so when I was reading your bio um and obviously sharing what I shared in the intro so your study on uh Sanskrit texts now mm-hmm. I hadn't heard of Sanskrit texts before um mm-hmm. this podcast or before doing my research okay. so uh well, firstly yeah wh- wh- where and how did you come across this text and can you just tell the listener a little bit about the, the sort of the history of Sanskrit texts as well? Sure. So India is one of the oldest uh, living civilizations that goes back at least 5,000 years and might be akin to, let's just say, China. And there is a, let's say this, there's a, a very um, broad and deep set of literature there that was written in the Sanskrit language. So um, I don't know all the history about Sanskrit, but you know it's a language that again goes back thousands of years. And many of the great thinkers of India um, encoded, or uh, you know, their knowledge, or they wrote various stories. And there are different, there there are different um, texts, there are different um, scriptures. Let's say so they're known generally as the Vedas. The word Veda means to know but they're known as the Vedas. And then within them, there are um, subsections of these of these different texts. One of the branches is also called Ayurveda. Like some people know about that. Ayurveda is a holistic health science that comes out of India, like what Chinese medicine is to China. Ayurveda is to India. And so it talks about how to live a, a healthy life. So you've got, you have everything from philosophy and poetry and aesthetics and various stories and parables and mm. epistemology like you know the the study of knowledge itself um there are things like logic um various forms like what is logic and similar things that you would find like in the greek literature or socratic so s- um, similar to like, like your that. stoicism type kind of oh wisdom all, all of all of that will be there. I mean, it's it's like an it's an ocean. If you whatever you want to go into, you'll find you will find. Um, it's it's kind of like the I don't want to trivialize it to say it's like the the Costco of uh, or the it's like the better it's like the Amazon of spiritual, um, psychological, philosophical knowledge. You want to know anything about virtually any aspect of life when it comes to like life knowledge and life wisdom, you'll find it there. Um, and one of my colleagues at the, uh, at the time while I was there was a, he was a PhD in Sanskrit, in the language Sanskrit. And he was also a, uh, a master, he had a master's in technology and software development too. So he was very modern, but at the same time, he also understood these ancient texts and he was studying from one of these traditional scholars. So somebody who didn't go into the Western school system, but was studying in this lineage. There was a more of a, um, a teacher to teacher lineage, sort of like, you know, the master teaches the disciple and then he teaches another disciple and it sort of goes down. So this lineage went back like hundreds of years. And so he was studying from him and, then the benefit of that, of course, is that you're studying with somebody who's not only, it's not just like you're showing up at a university and they're teaching you a class, but this is somebody who's lived that knowledge. And so they're passing down not just the the, the scripts and the interpretation, but also mm. their practiced and realized knowledge about yeah, their experience as well. So that's why when you study in that fashion, it comes, it comes across a little bit with, with um, much greater... Uh, potency. Let me let me put it that way. So I was fortunate to be able to have access to that, and um, and also being from the West, I was able to bridge at least in my own sense. I was able to bridge the gap. I studied some um, psychology and uh, Western philosophy and whatnot. So I was able to make certain connections. And for me, the most important thing was how do I make that knowledge practical actionable and useful to people because, you know, it could also become an intellectual, um, you know, exercise where you're, you're just, um, you know, you, you just become besotted with it and lost within that. I don't, I didn't want to, to do that. I wanted to take the, the knowledge that I had gained and to make it, to make it valuable, to make it useful. So that's, I guess that's that crossover between where, you know, that, epiphany that you had and 
you know the idea that you obviously the, the message that you share that everyone has their innate tigers as, as you put it and then yes. you know mixing that in with the the knowledge that you learned that was a bit of a light bulb moment i guess is, is i mean did, did the two sort of come together did yeah, that there, that form a lot of what, what you're teaching at the school is that for, for sure i, I I would say it was sort of like, you know, different realizations at different times. The, that first one about realizing that I have this educative capacity, that was probably the most striking because um, it, it just, it, it revealed to me what my most valuable quality would be to the world. So that's why that, that was probably the most powerful. And then when I got into these into the depths of my study and research. And then it became, what can I bring to these children? So when I got into the, into the texts, and then that was revealed to me, light bulbs started going off. And I think one of the benefits that I have, having grown up in America, is that I believe that we've got an excellent way of taking things and sort of, whether I say like putting them together or making them accessible, either packaging them or branding them that we've got this knack for that. And it can, and sometimes it can, it can be a little bit um, nerve wracking when, when it gets overdone, but at the same time, uh, when, when it's too much commercialized and it feels like that, but in this case, for me, being able to put those concepts into something accessible, like the idea of tigers that I found to be really valuable because otherwise the information wasn't that accessible. Like I had to go to India. I had to like get with somebody who read Sanskrit. I had to spend a lot of time going, reading and, you know, falling asleep, reading a lot of boring things. And um, other times yeah, there'd be interesting stuff as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, being able to take that information and then put it into a concept in a simple way that I could now turn around to somebody with and say in a single line, feed your tigers before they eat you. And, even if you didn't understand what that meant, you could look at it and say, like, I kind of get what he's talking about. I elaborate just a little bit. And in another line, if I say everybody has natural abilities, which are like tigers, and when you feed them, you're happy. And when you don't feed them, it eats away at you from inside. And then it's like, oh, I know what he's talking about. Like, I have this musical thing that I, I really want to do, and I'm not doing it. It's like itching. Or I want to open up this company, and I've been dying to do it, and I'm not doing it. It's really like eating away at me. So... And you know what's what's really funny, Matt, which is that th this is not unlike the, what the traditional Indians used to do, but in Sanskrit, in the original languages, they had what are called sutras. I mean, you, you might have heard of something like the, the Kama Sutra. So a sutra is, is a phrase or a verse. And if you see in the traditional literature, it was originally an oral tr tradition. It wasn't written down. And so people would encode things in, in poems. And in poetry, in these little sutras. So they were like small lines of poetry that were packed with meaning. And so, and people would memorize them. It made it easy to memorize when it was in that form. And so it's, what I'm trying to say is that it's not uncommon that they would take information and then encode it into simpler forms that were mm. more digestible that could then be expanded when you got into them. And so I think I'm just repeating that same thing, but in a modern way, in a Western context. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what a good teacher does, doesn't it? Take, takes the complicated and the complex and turns it into easy to understand, easier to understand and actionable sort of strategies for people exactly what, what's more important than nature or nurture both they're both important and so um what that means is you're born with natural propensities and that comes from your genes there's no question about that scientists know this and another thing that's important to recognize is that by the age of six much of your brain that is is well developed a, an interesting stat that I read said that we have, when we're born, 100 billion neurons. And by age six, 90% of the neural connections are already made. So that means from age six until the time that you die, it's only 10% of the remaining neurons that are getting connected during that time. So you can imagine, that's why, like, I believe nature drives us so much because it's sort of like, almost like... Um, an iceberg what's going on under us was really formed in our earliest years when we might not have realized it 
And so that's important to recognize that th- that number one, a lot has already come has come with us from our, our parents uh, and through our our genetic makeup. That said, when we are provided with environments that are conducive to to those particular qualities, the bigger ones, the bigger tigers, so to speak, the ones where we're more naturally endowed, they take off. So for example, if you have, let's just say this creative or musical tiger that, and it's, and it's something that you're, you're, it was there in your parents or one of your parents, you also got it. If you are afforded an opportunity to do something musical from an early age, you're exposed to music, you're mm. encouraged to play an instrument, uh, you're brought to uh, concerts or you know, watching stuff on on YouTube or TV or wherever it might be. So that's going to develop. And here the difference is that when you've got a natural inclination towards something, when your your tiger underneath all this is naturally bigger, what happens in terms of the nurture is for every bit of energy or every bit of effort that you put in, you get a a um almost like an exponential return on the investment in terms of your progress. Mm. And you would have seen this because you're you're into you know physical training and physical development. So you know that there's some people who come in who have a natural, their bodies are just sort of meant for athletics. And they can do something, it could be a sport, it could be a type of exercise, use a particular machine or uh, whatever it might be. They do, it's the first time they've done it, they put in a little effort and it's like, boom, they're already off to the races with that. And then there's other people who come in and they can work for months and they still don't get the same results as that person who might have gotten that in a couple of days or, or, or a couple of weeks. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's one Still example time. That you, that, that, you, that you see. Uh, but then that's true for language and that's true for... Um, um, people who are have that entrepreneurial um, tiger that might be big, or people who have the creative tiger. So, given those circumstances, um, you know, the, the, those people are going to thrive much more quickly, and and that's important. Hard work is important, but also you'll make more progress if you're focusing on tigers that are that are bigger. So, is there room, like, if you have a, a weakness that you want to work on for, for someone that? has that innate kind of ability already they're obviously not going to put quite so much effort in if they've already got that natural ability um but you can still you, you know you still got the capacity to improve upon that weakness you might just have to work a little bit harder at it so i love this question and i think that there's a lot of misconception about this I don't talk about tigers in terms of weaknesses and strengths. I talk about them in terms of being big or being small. And why I do this is because determining whether something is a weakness or a strength has nothing to do with the tiger itself, but the circumstance. So for instance, there could be somebody who, this is a a favorite, um, like one of my favorite examples that I give. There could be somebody who, um, they work for um, the the um, at an airport, an airport security, and when the bags go by, they have to be there and make sure that n- none goes by with something questionable in it. So, in order to do that, a protective tiger is required. That means this tendency to want to prevent harm, loss, injury, wrongdoing. So, if they've got a large protective tiger, they will be able to st- like stand there and co- or sit there and look constantly. And without getting tired and they feel energized while they do it. And you might look at them and say, oh my God, that must be so boring just watching it. But for mm. somebody with a big protective tiger, that's going to be, that will excite. At the same time, if that person has a really big entertaining tiger or a creative tiger or an interpersonal tiger, like where they want to be funny and they want to talk to people. And so those are big tigers. But in this situation, those are Just liabilities. The wrong ones. <laughs> they are liabilities. You could say that they're a weakness in this situation. Now, take those same qualities, a big musical, a big creative tiger, a big interpersonal tiger, entertaining tiger, and you put it in, in the, the you know, put the person in a situation where they have to be an MC or they have to do a podcast or they want to be an influencer. Well, suddenly it's a strength. So yeah. I say this because I don't want people walking around thinking they have weaknesses. I would rather people realize that I've got big and small tigers, medium ones, and what I need to do is figure out what situations are the ones where I can best apply my tigers to in terms of a job or in terms of maybe, you know, hobbies or things that they do. And 
by making those choices, they align their bigger tigers with activities that require those big tigers, and they'll find greater contentment with that. Yeah. And then there's other people to do the other jobs. So that's how I want people to look at it and not feel bad that your linguistic is not that big or your um, creative is not that big or your entrepreneurial is not that big. Don't worry about that. How does someone go about acknowledging at what point is a struggle something that they, it is a bit of a weakness and it could do with a bit of room for improvement as opposed to it's just, it's just uh, something they shouldn't really be chasing. You know, you know that yes, whole yes. question, when do I say no to something and when do I yes. say yes? Sure. So I think the, the first thing is to recognize which are big and which are small tigers. And, um, you know, I've, I've got, I have some tools that could also help about that, help about that. But just talking casually as we are, the first thing that I have people do is to do an assessment of yourself and to figure out, is it a big, medium or small tiger? And what I mean by that is when I do this particular activity, whether it's like, let's say, organizing things or public speaking, or if I have to do something with uh, writing with language, or if I've got to draw or you know paint or do some kind of illustration. So am I, am I attracted to it naturally? Yeah. That's the first question. Like, is it something that when I see it, I can't stop myself from wanting to go and do it? Like if I see that gym or I see some athletic equipment or I'm, pa I'm passing by like a, a sporting goods store, I can't stop myself from going in and doing that. It's just like calling me. Or for other people, it might be if there's some like, you know, colored pens and some, you know, fresh paper on the, on a table that something says, oh, okay, pick up that pen and just like draw a flower and like make something. So it's calling them to, or if it's musical for somebody else, or if it's a person in the conversation, or oh, there's somebody standing alone by themselves, I should just strike up a conversation. So what are you naturally drawn toward? Like, that's the first question to ask. Then the second thing to ask is when I engage in this activity, while I'm doing it, does it bring me joy? Am I yeah. absorbed in doing it? Because there's some people who say, oh, I want to be a business, you know, business person. I want to have my own company and blah, blah, blah. But if you watch them while they're in the process of doing entrepreneurial activities and doing marketing, are they suffering while they're doing it? And here are some of the other signs, right? Like when you have to do that kind, that particular type of activity, do you go and just do it right away? Or do you stimulate, right? I need a second cup of coffee first in order to get myself ready mm. to do it. Right. Mm. Or do I need to eat like, you know, a, a power bar or some piece of chocolate or like a muffin or, right. Or, uh, you know, uh, my second coffee with a power bar or so look for those kind of signs. Like when you're trying to like con yourself into doing it, but first you need now, first I have to watch these YouTube videos to get in the mood or mm. to, right. Or it could be to smoke or to stimulate. So that's one of the ways that you know that while you're doing it, um, there's probably not, it's not as big a tiger as you might be thinking. So yeah, I guess the things that you do when you're just naturally inspired to do it, you know, I guess yeah. what they call that the intrinsic motivation, don't they? When you, mm -hmm. you just you just want to do it as opposed yeah. to, oh, I've got to finish this project to make my boss happy or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. Anytime you, you have to push yourself, force yourself, it's not coming naturally. And you'll know what that is because depending upon the size of the tiger, um, the, the resistance to doing it is going to be greater. So there's one which is called a providing tiger, you know, giving, helping, serving, taking care of, um, cooking for. So um, if you need to do something for somebody, right, do you avoid, like if they're calling you and you know that they're going to be asking you for are you avoiding them? Or like do you immediately, do you call them in anticipation and say, hey, let me, you know, I know that you need some help. I sort of sensed it. Can I give you some assistance? So you'll see the degree to which you resist and hold back and avoid versus you, um, you know, step up to do it because you look forward to it because it gives you, I mean, from the brain perspective, it's giving you a dopamine hit. That's what's actually going on. You know, when dopamine releases in the brain, that's your, the reward function of your brain. When you do something where there's a, a some sort of reward given, um, then it's like the motivation part of that that's going on. So if it's something where you're not, and, and here's, let's use sports for an example, right? If you have a natural incl inclination towards sports, um, you, let's say it's tennis or I'm playing table tennis these days, right? So when I'm playing with somebody and 
if I'm learning and I'm doing well and I'm and it's coming naturally to me and I'm making that progress, everything is flowing. But sometimes when I get frustrated, maybe I'll play with a player who's much more advanced than I am and he's putting all these spins on the ball and I can't hit them back. And I start to get frustrated and nothing seems to work and I get angry. So that's also a sign, which is, are you are you making progress when you do something? So if it's something which when you start into doing it, and it's giving you a lot of resistance right from the very beginning, even for something that's considered by most people to be an easy task. That's a sign. Like, so your question was like, when do I know? Um, you, I mean, you said a weakness, but I would say like, when do I know that this small tiger and this situation, like I got a problem and I better like get a different strategy. So that that's really it. When you're, when you have to do something where, you see most people don't struggle with it, but you're struggling with it even when it's considered to be something that, that might be easier for others. And the mistake that most people make is that they start getting on their own case. Like they start to blame themselves. They start to beat themselves up. Um, you know, you're such an idiot. You're a loser. You know, you, you and then they, they start doing all sorts of other weird things like, you know, some people might push themselves to do it and make themselves frustrated, angry, and piss off other people also. Uh, and, or they might, as I'm mentioning, they might medicate or, you know, stimulate in order to get through it. And so, well, in those situations, if it's a one-off situation or if it's like a hobby or something like that, it's like, okay, I don't need to be playing this because I'm not getting pleasure or, um, or if it's a task that you have to do at work, it's like, okay, I'll just sort of, uh, push myself through it. But if it's something you have to do day in and day out, if yeah. this is like a mainstay of your work. Well, yeah, I guess because like for, for us at LPT, like exercise is a good example, right? Because let's face it, you know, some majority of the people that come to our, our facility, you know, they, um, they, they, one of the things they tell us is they struggle with the motivation to exercise regularly. And that's why they need, need a, a team to help support them and motivate them. And as much as we do that, we also try and empower people and encourage them to find their internal motivation because relying yeah. on you know coaches and external people all the time if that's the reason that they're doing the, the training the exercise and they haven't built that internal kind of you know um will or want yeah to exercise and, and have those associations to the reasons why it's so important you know if, if those associations aren't quite there yet you know, this is yep. going to help me live longer. This is going to help me play with my grandchildren when they're older. This is going to help me if I want to go traveling, I'm going to be able to go on long walks and have, you know, if all of those connections aren't really there and they're seeing the exercise part of the process is just something like, oh, I've got to do this as a chore, like cleaning your house or something. Yes. Then they're never going to build that intrinsic motivation and it's, they're never going to turn that small tiger into a big tiger, if that's even possible. Um, well, to, to address what you, you were just saying before, I, I'm not really sure that whether those kind of um, incentives or those kind of points when you put them out there really change people's attitude that much. In other words, to say, hey, you need to be doing this so you can travel or to see, because it's something that's far off in the future. And when I'm exercising right now, I need to see if it's like, if this is fun right now. I mean, for that reason, there's so many people who smoke cigarettes and it's never really been much of a, you know, a case, like a, a reason for people to stop when you say, oh, just imagine you might be sick later on. I mean, people really go far down the path mm. of, of having emphysema or something. And they're, they're like, listen, you better stop that because this, these tumors here, you know, you only have like, you know, about a couple of years to live. And so it's only when, and, and not always. Um, By that but, point, oops. they're like, well, uh, what's the point now then? <laughs> <laughs> right. But what I do think can work, and this is where the tigers can play a role. And I know that it's worked for me. Like, for example, there are different types of exercise and depending upon what's, which other tigers of yours, so like we would call it a bodily tiger, right? So um, gross bodily. So that, like the, if somebody's got an enormous gross bodily tiger where they're, they're naturally fit and they're going to seek it out already. So you're probably not going to have to push them or motivate them too much. But somebody might have a big naturalistic tiger. That means they love to be, the, be in the outdoors, so plants, nature, animals, the environment. So if you hook those two tigers up, in other words, that, you know, maybe for them working out in the gym is not going to be as motivating as working out outside or some combination of the two. 
If somebody's got an interpersonal tiger that they love being around other people, well, then solo running or just running on a machine by themselves is going to bore them. So they'll have a hungry tiger, which is the interpersonal. So what do you do? Get them a partner or a team, you know, or do team sports or when they when they work out, if they're going to be on treadmill or something like that, or have a, an exercise, have a partner while you're doing it. So sometimes people mess up in these in these very small areas. If your musical is bigger, right? So then uh, incorporate the, incorporate that into it. So it might be dance. Like for example, I have an Oculus, and there's some really cool um, tools inside the Oculus where you you know you're dancing and you're also you're you're using your body, and so you're exercising to a beat or something, right? So mm. I mean, you got Zumba and you have other things like that. So I think it's important for people to figure out which of their which of their other tigers they could rope in together that's unique to to them because um if your if your creativity is really high and you're going to be doing something which is dull and repetitive so i don't think that that's really going to keep somebody um maintained for long because that creative tiger is just going to go like berserk so therefore for them a different routine might be like every time they come to exercise, they might need to have a different routine as opposed to somebody who's that's less really, creative. Uh, yeah, that's adventurous. really interesting. You know, you just kind of like, so I, I'm obviously, I've been a trainer for like 15 years. Um, one of the things I've always struggled with um, as a trainer is, is following really rigid training programs. You know, now as a PT, it's one of the first things that you learn is, is how to create a, a macro and micro training cycle which are quite rigid, are quite structured. They're more for really Olympic athletes, basically. So mm-hmm. you, <laughs> and then you soon learn that most people want a bit of variety because it just gets too boring. And I've certainly, as a, as a, as a fairly, cr- I guess I would class myself in the sort of creative spectrum. Um, I've always liked the, the, the variable side. I've always liked to mix things up and, um, you know, but also have enough structure that you can see progression as well. And that's one of the things that we do in LPT. But um, yeah, it's really interesting because we, we've just started setting some goals with the clients and uh, we've just, um, I, I've just signed up to an event with some of our members later on in the year. And this particular event, just, just for some reason, over the last three or four months, it really motivated me more than any event that I've entered for many years and I wasn't quite sure why and I think you've probably just hit the nail on the head it's that this particular event um, is very varied so that mm. there's something like eight different parts to the event there's running in between there's there's different there's there's leg work there's speed work there's endurance there's and uh, so from a training perspective it's it's really fun because every training session that i do is extremely varied and so it that could fits be your creative in, that could be your creative tiger yeah yeah it's, it fits in with the the value that i have of, of training I, I, I enjoy i said when i say enjoy Troy training i mean I, I do argue anyone that loves exercise i always say to people people don't love exercise they love an aspect of what exercise gives them so it mm-hmm. might be what you call the dopamine hit, you know, that, that, that mm-hmm. r- runner's high. It might be that release. Or if you're going for a stressful time, it kind of just releases all the stress. For some people, it is about that PB, you know, well, I did 100 kilo deadlift last mm-hmm. week and I got 105 this week. So they like that self-satisfaction that they've just improved on themselves some way. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I find from, from training lots of people, there's so many different factors at LPT. We do very small group PT. And I think the community factor has a part for some people. It's that they, they like just being in a bit of a community, you know, sure. th- these days, so much of what happens in life is online. It's nice to get together with a few people. Um, yeah. So I think there's this very multifaceted. And yeah. I think that's something for anyone listening who does struggle, particularly with the motivation to exercise is, is you're going to find it along the way and knowing yourself is going to really help. So, um, yeah, you just give me some clarity there, Stephen. Thank yeah. you. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that's the power of the tigers there. There it is. Recruit them, use your tigers, recruit, recruit your tigers to help you. Yeah, sure. And, um, so in terms of using these tigers, how, 
how can we help people listen or listeners create a, a big issue that we have currently and, and so many people coming to us are struggling with anxiety they're struggling with overwhelm and stress how can mm. we help people gain greater balance in their life to to manage sure. manage life so let's look at two situations one is what i would call overfed tigers the other is what i would call underfed tigers and this comes straight out of these like 5,000 year old texts, what's called um, ayoga and ati yoga, these two concepts. So one actually means like overdoing it and the other means underdoing it. So you're, if you had, let's just say an administrative tiger and, or it could be your bodily, right? And you do too much of it, you do, you work out too much, or if you're doing too much administration, too much paperwork, et cetera. So after a while, you just start to feel burnout and so that, that's like that with anything. You eat too much of actual actual food, or you do some particular activity too much. You, you're gonna you're gonna feel like burnt out as a result of it. So, when you are feeling burnout, it's important to recognize that what are the things that are burning you out. I'll give you an example. You could also have like, let's say your interpersonal tiger is like only medium, right? It's not that big, which means that you can be exposed to people and interact with people throughout the day, but too much uh, is, is not great. But if you're constantly, you're in an open office environment and you have a lot of meetings with people and you've been with people like all day for many days and, and whatnot, and then you maybe go home and then there's people in the house. So you'll start to burn out, but you might not realize that the reason is because of overexposure to people. Or if it's administrative, that's being overfed, or both of those. So for me, the important thing is to recognize that which are the ones that are being overfed? Like, what is it that's actually burning you out? That's important to recognize. And, well, what you can do is that if it's short term, again, most people would just deal with it. You, you have a Band-Aid, you would put up with it, you would um, you know, blow off some steam doing something else and you get back to, to life. But if it's something that you're, you have to do day in and day out and the situation is like that repeatedly, it's not advisable and you would need to change that. So that would mean uh, on one end, if you're working for somebody, to request a change in your workload or the tasks that you're doing or to insource some support for you or to um, change, you know, move horizontally someplace. There are many ways that you can remedy that. In other cases, it might be changing jobs. Mm. And I don't, I don't always advocate that, you know, people, if things aren't working out and you're feeling burnout, that the solution is to quit because you might just walk back into a similar situation someplace else. So that's what's important is to, to recognize what it is that's burning you out, which tigers are being overfed. Uh, and then deciding how you want to remedy that. On the other end of the spectrum is what I would call underfed or hungry tigers. That's when you've got like a creative tiger, a musical tiger, or um, uh, an entrepreneurial tiger that's not being fed. And as a result, it's eating away at you from inside. Yeah, I, one of the, the quotes, um, Dr. Martini. I don't know if you know Dr. Martini. he talks about values pretty much in every one of his talks um, is, is, a, is a massive proponent of, of knowing your values. But he talks about, you know, one of the best ways to, to learn who you are and what your core values are is, is by looking at your voids, voids, voids of where the values are. Um, and that kind of what you just said there sort of marries It's a bit up. of a void. Yeah. Yeah. It's, what, where's it's the voids void. in my life? What are the things that I've got the itch for that I keep putting right. off? Yeah, that so the, I call them hungry tigers. So, so then yeah, when, the when question, we're kids, we we just mm -hmm. go for them, don't we? Like when we're young, mm -hmm. um, it's you know a kid just naturally is gravitates I guess, more open that, right? to gravitates to chasing their tigers, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. They they. I have a daughter who's two years old, and and it's so funny to to watch. She's so not not conditioned. So she she gravitates toward whatever she's interested in, you know, mm. and, and even if you say, okay, enough of that, you have to start. Nope. She'll go, she'll go straight back to that. So they're a bit more um, transparent and clear as we get older, we, we get conditioned and we realize that, okay, this is not a situation where I can, you know, I'm in a group, I'm in a meeting with 10 other people and um, my creative tiger and my visual tiger are teaming up and they need to doodle right now. And you recognize that you can't take out a piece of paper and just start you know, drawing little frilly things on, on the paper because people will say, you know, hey, what the heck are you doing? Like, this is a serious meeting. 
Um, so we do that, but that doesn't mean that we we don't feel we we don't feel the frustration. We feel it equally, but we're sort of stuck. And that's when you start to drink that second cup of coffee, which is okay in the meeting, or third cup, or you know, you you are eating a piece of chocolate or you're doing something to stimulate yourself. So um what you can do in those situations uh, is you, if you're working with for somebody, ask them to add some things to your profile that aren't there. You know, maybe there are some tigers that could be fed. If your educative tiger is a big one, like mine is, maybe you say, hey, are there any opportunities for me to do any trainings or coaching or things like that within, you know, our department or the company? Okay, so that's so like you, one way so of doing it. And Stephen, you, you have your own sort of program, right? That sort of teaches mm -hmm. this and helps people find their tigers. Yes. That's yeah. on, on, you can find that on the Feed Your Tigers uh, website, feed, feedyourtigers.com. So there's, there's some details. We've got a, an assessment that's there can, that can help you identify of the 19, like which ones are big, medium, and small. And uh, then there's also a tool that will show you like matching careers, uh, tasks, uh, even leisure activities. So like that's another way to do it too, right? Like let's say you've got some hungry tigers um, and you can't feed them in your workplace. Okay, you can also, you could do it as, like I like to look at this, I call it the menu of life. So just like when you go to a restaurant, I mean, I'm talking generally, but you might have appetizers, main courses and, and desserts. So you get most of your nutrition from the main course. You get some of it from the appetizers, There's a little fun in there. And desserts, you don't expect any nutrition. That, that's just pure fun. Mm. So in the same way with work, You've got like um, the main course would be your job. Uh, gigs, hustles would be uh, like an appetizer and a, a hobby or some kind of uh, leisure activity or an interest that would be like a dessert. So here we're talking, of course, um, remuneration instead of nutrition. So what I say is that your tigers don't actually care where they, where you get money from. They just care that they're eating. Mm. So that means that if you can feed lots of your big tigers in your job, well, all the better because it just means that you're really going to be a rock star in whatever it is that you're doing because you've you've recruited a lot of tigers around a particular. And that's why when you see people who are rock stars in their area, you'll be able to figure out that they have an, they have a number of tigers that are working together, um, big ones that are working together. But if you can't get them all eating there, you could always do a side, uh, you know, have some side work or have a hustle or have a hustle where um where you can also feed them so if you're that creative thing is not happening in your day job you could do something on etsy or do some uh something on fiverr for like uh or one of the like upwork one of the freelance sites where you're doing some design work etc so you might not make a lot of money i have a very good friend who's a researcher and she also does photography and so she's mm -hmm. it's a side gig for her but she's got a strong creative and visual tiger and for her, she takes a lot of landscape pictures and she puts them on the stock photo sites and she sells them. Yeah. That just gives her a lot of pleasure. I have another friend who um, who's an investor and he does like massive deals in the hundreds of millions of dollars, but he's also got a visual spatial tiger and creative and he's into furniture design. He doesn't make much money doing that, but mm. he designs like furniture and he like sells them. That's just a pure labor of love, but he does sell them and he makes a little bit of money doing that. So I, what I want to show is, and then of course, there are people who they've got hobbies, whether it's knitting or whether it's kite surfing or, um, you know, playing a musical instrument. That's another way that those tigers get, get fed. So my, my message that I want people to get is just make sure that all your tigers are being fed. And if you do that, you will be in, a, you'll be uh, from, from, well, at least from the Indian perspective, what they call swasta, which means you will be situated in yourself. And the word swasta, situated in yourself, means healthy. So when you're situated in yourself, you're feeding all your tigers. That's what health is. Health is not body mass index or your cholesterol mm -hmm. level. It's actually how situated in yourself and how well all your tigers are being fed. And, and that's actually what, what health. I mean, of course, you need to eat well and you need to, to, to do some exercise. There's no question. But the, fir well, the first step is actually getting yourself aligned. Yeah, and, and all of the things that you need, like good nutrition and fitness, they kind of sort themselves out when you've when you've got all of those lined up because you, yeah. you know you need the energy. You know the things that when you've got purpose and, and things that you're working towards and things you enjoy, you, yeah. you just naturally make better decisions anyway, right? 
Yeah, and even physically, this is what's so interesting, which is that when, and, and I'm just doing a scan of my body right now, right? When I'm in flow, as I feel like I, as I'm in right now, because we're talking and I'm sharing and educating, these ideas are just, they're, they're, they're just coming. M my brain is firing and it's, it's consuming a lot of calories. There, my my mm. brain is, is using a lot of um, energy in order to be able to do this. I'm in this like sort of flow state. I'm also noticing my, my breathing. I've got a small cough, but I mean, like that's, that's something which is, which is like weather related. Um, but apart, apart from that, um, I see, I feel my stomach to be very relaxed right now and loose. And when I'm breathing, I'm breathing from my stomach and when when you are in that relaxed state and you breathe from your stomach, so you're taking deeper breaths, you're getting more oxygen into the body, and then the body is going to be removing toxins and the blood is going to be oxygenated, more oxygen is going to go to the head. And so that virtuous cycle is, is going on. And this is what I've noticed, at least with my body. I notice that because I have a tendency to put on weight very easily. When I'm in these states, when I'm in these states naturally, for much of the day, um, I can eat what I want and not gain weight. That, and what I mean by that is that when I'm like, even before I had, when we started this interview, I had to eat, I had to eat dinner and I knew that we were going to be talking. I was getting excited about it. And while I was thinking about, okay, we're going to be talking and et cetera. And I was eating, like, I didn't want to eat a lot. Mm. Like I, I didn't, cause I was look, looking forward to this. So it's like, all right, let me finish eating something. I can go in and get ready. And so I'm just trying to show what happens. It's like, I didn't need to eat much and, and I didn't want to because the, my brain was already starting to secrete um, happy chemicals in anticipation of what was going on. And so I feel, I felt sated already. Whereas if there was something that I had to do where I wasn't interested to do it or something that I was avoiding, I would probably overeat you know, yeah. and I would feel tense yeah. and, and I'm trying to compensate because I'm not getting pleasure and I'm not getting, so I, I push myself and I, I'm not aware of my body. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of want to bring this back around to the, the physical part of it, how being situated in yourself, being in touch with the tigers and engaging them um, has a direct impact on your, on your physical health. Yeah. And, and the flip side of that is that everyone's experienced it when they're, when they're not, at one with themselves when they're not relaxed when they're feeling really stressed um what does what do most people do that they start eating high carb yep. sugar foods more stimulants and yep. to, to counteract that so yeah, yeah. um it's it, it, it kind of works both ways it's, it's definitely the biochemistry um is huge of, of you how your thoughts affect your hormones etc yeah. It's a really, really interesting topic, Stephen. I really enjoyed this conversation and um, just aware we're coming up to the hour mark. Do you have any last words of wisdom for our listeners of, of Mastery and you? Yeah, um, it's something like this, that um, wherever you go, there you are. Your nature has been there with you the entire time. And I say, don't, don't over endeavor to be something that you're not. You have everything that you need, like inside of you, you've got it already. And if you focus on that and you get down to that, it's, it's subtractive. It's not additive. You don't need to add more stuff. You need to reduce stuff and conditioning, get down to that. And when you're aligned with those tigers, you'll be able to um, adapt them in any situation in a way that's, um, that's relaxed, more relaxed, more easy, will bring you greater contentment and will work well for you across the board, better mood, you'll have a better mood, you'll, you'll earn more naturally, all those things will come to you. Um, so it's right there. Feed your tigers before they eat you. That's my message. That's your message. Well, I'm guessing that that ans maybe answers the question. Obviously, the name of this podcast is mastering you. In one sentence, how would you describe self mastery or mastering you? Yeah, mastering you is is knowing your tigers and and feeding them the right amount. Fantastic. Okay, Zim. Well, um, this has been awesome. Love this conversation, and uh, we'll, we'll share. So much, yeah, I, I'll be listening to your podcast as well. Um, feed your tigers. It's called right. Yeah, feed your tigers at feedyourtigers.com. Feedyourtigers.com. Go and check it out, guys. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks so much, man.